what happened to me 18 years ago. It was everything that you hear about when it comes to Char. Basically, I was a statistic. I was uh, 19 years old. It was my first 18 months in the Army. It was my first duty assignment. It happened on a Friday night um, between the hours of 2 and 5 in the barracks by a fellow soldier, and um, alcohol was involved. My incident, when it happened, uh, a staff sergeant who was the floor sergeant for my barracks actually heard me screaming and came out and I told him what had happened and he actually, in his boxer shorts, chased the perpetrator down the road about a block in the middle of Korean winter. Um, and then as soon as he came back, he got on the phone, the hallway phone, and called the MPs. Um, he also advised me, without any formal training, um, he advised me not to take a shower, um, not to use the bathroom and um, that the MPs would be there soon to transport me to the hospital. And uh, that's, that's exactly what happened. There was not a lot of avenues to, um, to support a victim like there is now. There wasn't victim advocates, there wasn't a SHARP program, there weren't SARCs. My experience is very different than what soldiers today male or female get when they're going through treatment as a victim of sexual assault. Uh, everything that I got really was mentorship. And so it was really my organization that supported me and helped me through it. I got direct mentorship from my supervisors and they really got involved and helped me get through the process and explain to me that you know, there's going to be a court martial and there will be a process that you have to go through, but it will eventually end. And because alcohol was involved, I was enrolled into the Army Substance Abuse Program and had some counseling through them as well as kind of an education process. And then really just talking about the incident, I was in a group setting where um, other victims talked about their experiences and what happened to them. And it, I thought it was very, very worthwhile. It was really the people directly around me that still treated me like I was a valued member of the team, uh, still gave me duties and responsibilities, still held me to a standard, and still expected me to be a soldier. And, and that was honestly the, the biggest help for me, was knowing that in spite of this, that I could still contribute to the team. I felt that because I was victimized that, I ex that there was a certain expectation of the people around me to treat me a certain way. And by saying that, I mean that I expected them to allow me to sleep in and not go to formation and to kind of do my own thing because I had this traumatic incident that happened to me. And while it was traumatic, the best thing that they did and that any chain of command could do is to continue to hold your soldiers accountable and hold them to the standard, the Army standard. Not whatever personal standards you have, but the Army standard. And if you hold me to a different standard, then it becomes a slippery slope for other soldiers in the organization. It affects good order and discipline. And as, as a young private, I didn't understand that. As a command sergeant major, I completely understand the importance of ensuring that good order and discipline and, and mission command and, and taking care of the organization as a whole is the most important process. And even if it means holding somebody accountable for their actions, whether or not they're a sexual assault victim. I think that that's very important for, for all organizations to understand. The advice that I would give to victims is report it and then trust the process. What CID can investigate are, are something entirely different and while they might not be able to get a perpetrator on sexual assault, for, for instance, um, or rape or attempted rape. What they can get them on is something else. And because we can, we can add charges on that are different than what the civilian court can hold accountable as far as standards of conduct that we expect in our profession. So I think the Army does a very good job. Um, from my experience. The Army does a very good job and I've been a panel member for a court-martial for a sexual assault case and I obviously went through the sexual assault process as a victim in a court-martial. I believe in the process. I think it's very important that that military justice prevails in this and the reason that I say that is because my perpetrator for example they were they had many many charges uh, for him they had assault they had sexual assault attempted rape there's just a laundry list of charges what they got him on in the end 
is because he broke into my room was unlawful entry. He got 30 days in jail, in a Korean jail, and he got a bad conduct discharge. So receiving a bad conduct discharge is something that will carry through the rest of your life and it will um, keep you from being able to get certain positions. And even in the completely civilian sector, there's many positions that he will never be able to do based on a bad conduct discharge. I kind of re-victimized myself over and over again by thinking that this isn't the outcome and I can't believe that they didn't believe me. And it really, I, I turned it into something about me. I, I, when he was found not guilty of everything but that, but uh, everything but unlawful entry, I thought, how can they not believe me? And so for my advice to, to victims would be, don't make it about you. A prosecution has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that what happened happened. And it, nine times out of 10 comes down to he said, she said. Nine times out of 10. That's just the way that it is. It's the nature of the beast with sexual assault. If you're victimized, you're going to be re-victimized in the process. It's just the way that it is. Um, you're going to have to tell your story over and over and over again. And it will be grueling and it will be ugly and it will not be comfortable, um, but it's part of the process and you have to trust the process that the army is going to do the right thing on some level that military justice will prevail and, and then move on. Being able to have a fresh start and getting past it and starting my life over again and, and having goals and things that I wanted to accomplish, going to college, going to drill sergeant school, going to airborne school, having friends around me that supported me throughout good or bad um, was something that was very important to me. And so you have to find things that are positive in your life and hang on to those things because it, it, is, it is a very traumatic process. I've been able to use my my prior experience as a victim by being able to take a step back and understand really what the victim is going through. I have had a couple uh, victims in my formation and um, really my experience has taught me that you don't smother, you don't surround. There's going to be plenty of people to do that. As a command team, it's really just to support and whatever it is that that soldier needs um, provide them with it, whether it's the chaplain, whether it's a counselor, it could be the military life, family life consultant, it could be, uh, it could be the victim advocate, it could be the the SARC, the brigade, or installation SARC. It's really whatever that victim needs, as far as support, you have to provide that to them, and then just leave them alone. Um, it's a lot to process. Leadership needs to understand that. As a victim, they need to just take a step back. And so I've been able to really provide insight within the battalion that you need to just give the victims what they need as far as support and then just check on them every once in a while and make sure that they're doing all right. But if you can leave them in class, leave them in class. If you can, as much as possible, not to change their daily battle rhythm because it is very, very important that they still have some semblance of normalcy and that they feel like they're contributing to the force as a whole. Your primary job is to take care of that soldier. Um, it, whether they're the victim or the perpetrator, your primary job is to make sure that they still have professional development opportunities, that while they may be flagged because they're under investigation, that you still take care of them, give them responsibilities, give them something to do on a daily basis. But most importantly, what you don't do as a company commander, squad leader, platoon leader, platoon sergeant, or first sergeant, the one thing that you never do is say, I don't believe you, or I, I don't see how that this happened, or you don't become the judge and the jury. There's a process for that. It goes to CID, it goes to the military justice system, and there's a panel that will decide whether or not that incident actually happened. What you worry about is the victim or the perpetrator and making sure that all of their rights are taken care of. At the end of the day, your, your entire process and your entire job as a senior leader or as any leader in the United States Army is to take care of soldiers. And you have to remember that every single person in your formation could be a victim. They, they could be somebody that will one day be a garrison commander a battalion commander, a battalion command sergeant major, who at one time something happened to them and how they take care of soldiers when they're going through the same incident 
is going to dictate, it's going to shape how they take care of people in the future. How I was taken care of has shaped my ability to take care of soldiers now in my formation when this, when this does happen. And so really it's an education process from, from the top down. It's, it's something that I consistently beat into my company leadership is that you don't need to worry about that. Take that process out of your mind and take care of that soldier because that soldier might one day be in charge of something. It might be somebody important and they're going to dictate how soldiers are taken care of in the future based on what you do today. My battalion commander and I, when we first took uh, command of the battalion and the command positions that we're in currently, what we decided within the first, I believe it was the first two weeks, is we decided, hey, we need a battle rhythm. We put together a flow chart, a sharp flow chart. And so regardless of who's on duty, it's at every single CQ desk, it's in the CQ office, and it's posted on our sharp boards as well. So there's multiple places that that NCO that's on duty can go to. And if a soldier comes up to them and says, Sergeant, I was sexually assaulted yesterday, last night, on the way back from the shop at whatever the case may be, that NCO can immediately go to the sharp flow chart and look at what it is that they're supposed to do. Clearly, if the victim came forward to this NCO, it's now unrestricted. So we have a list of numbers that are called. There, there's the VA, there's the leadership, there's the b brigade SARC, uh, the installation SARC, CID. There's all of those numbers are already on there and it flows in a way that they know who do you call first. And so that was something that we established and has, we found that it's been very, very helpful in when, when a soldier does come forward and say something happened to me that they know immediately who to call. My advice to females that want to fit into any organization where they're the minority, which is a lot, um, male dominated units and now some of the combat arms MOSs, when I was a junior E5, I had just been promoted probably three or four months, and I was in an all-male platoon. And it was very important for me that I fit in because, A, I was a minority as a female, and B, they already had a bond in a team that I wasn't part of because I wasn't in the MOS. And so when I got to the platoon, there was a lot of things that I, I did put up with, um, a lot of vulgar language, crude, jokes, um, just really inappropriate language and conduct um, on behalf of those. A lot of them were NCOs. And because I wanted to fit in, I, I never said anything because it was, it was important to me that I was one of the team. And I, uh, I am very, very aware that that is a very uncomfortable position to be in for any female. My advice would be that you're going to be part of the team. You will be part of the team on your own merit be physically fit, know your job, know what you're supposed to do, be at the right place in the right time in the right uniform, and you will become part of that team. But you should never put yourself in a position where you're allowing people to say inappropriate things to you because it is a slippery slope. And it's one of those things that once you open up that gate, it's really, really hard to close it again. It's very hard six months down the line to put your foot down and say, this is unacceptable if you didn't say it at the beginning because then really what, what that calls into question is your ability to stand up for yourself to your peers or to your superiors. And it also, it, it's hard to pull that back and to rein that back in. And that will immediately ostracize you from that team as if down the line you decide, hey, this is, an in, this is inappropriate. Whereas if you say it right out, as uncomfortable as it may be, and yeah, it's going to shut some of your peers down and some of your superiors down, but the bottom line is it's doing the right thing. And it's setting a condition for a work environment that says this is unacceptable and I'm not going to be treated different just because I'm not the same gender as you. And once you do that, it will pay off in the end. But it, yes, will it be uncomfortable up front? Absolutely. But it's very important that you don't sacrifice your professionalism as, as a means to fit into a team. My motivation to share my story was that somebody needs to talk about what the Army has done. And my perspective and my experience um, was completely different than what you hear 
in the median, what you see on movies and on TV, it's, it's completely different. The Army took care of me, and my chain of command took care of me, and I think that while this very horrible traumatic thing happened to me, um, look where I am today. I was able to overcome it, and I, there's not enough stories that are being talked about. There's not enough former victims that are now battalion command sergeant majors that can say, hey, this horrible thing happened to me, but I was able to overcome it through counseling and supportive leadership and mentorship and development, and, and look where I am today.